Morning, guys. If this is your first time here, welcome. My name is John. I'm one of the leaders here. And as Travis said, we're beginning a new preaching series in the book of Amos. And this is going to run for a couple months and take us into June. And I think this is going to be a really good time for you and for me and for us to reflect on the world around us and ask the question, does God care? People who believe in God often still struggle with that question of, does God care? And this can come in the form of questioning whether God cares for you and the people around you in your life, as in, does God see and care, and will he do anything about the person who crushed your spirit with terrible words or unkept promises or unmet expectations, or the supervisor that disrespected and and dishonored you and, and hurt your career? The church leader that cared more about promoting his his name and his agenda than maybe knowing your heart and and nurturing and loving you. Or the contractor or the business that ripped you off. Does God care? It can also be a little bit bigger than that. We can step out and say, does God care about evil and suffering in the world? Does God care about those people that are right now experiencing extreme poverty and they don't have enough food to eat and they don't even have a place to call home right now? Does God care about what politicians and influencers and human traffickers and corporations and churches are doing? Does he care about the justice or the injustice of their actions? At different points in history, God has chose people to speak for him and answer that question. And Amos is one of those prophets that delivered God's message and answered the question, does God care? So God's message in 750 B.C. through the life and mouth of Amos is going to be our big idea for today. And it's this. God cares. Deeply, truly, and for reasons and in ways we have trouble understanding. And he holds all people accountable. Not just the worst of the worst, but all people, everywhere, through all time. That is, God truly and deeply sees and cares about evil and suffering and injustice in the world, all the way down to what's going on in your life. Nothing and no one will go undetected and unexposed. As comforting or appealing as the thought of God finally bringing justice to the world is, there is going to be a part of this that we find a little less comforting and maybe a little less appealing. Think about it. If all injustice and lack of love for God and love of fellow man is exposed and judged, then God will remind us through Amos that our friends and our family and their unjust actions and words and their lack of love for God and their lack of love for other people will be exposed and judged. And at the end of the day, Amos' words remind us our very own unjust actions and words, our own lack of genuine affection for God and our own lack of overflowing love for other people, it's going to be shown for what it is and it's going to be judged. The question this book is going to force you and I and us to wrestle with is not just does God care, but do you actually, truly want a perfectly beautiful and loving and wise and all-powerful king to care about the state of your heart? in your life? Do you really want a king to hold everyone, including you, accountable? I know we all just settled in, but would you stand? I'm going to read our whole passage today. It's not short. I don't think it'll take that long. I'm going to read from Amos 1.1 all the way to chapter 2, verse 3. So Amos 1.1 to 2.3, if you've got that up, follow along with me. This is God's word in the book of Amos. The words of Amos, who was one of the sheep breeders from Tekoa, What he saw regarding Israel in the days of King Uzziah of Judah and Jeroboam, son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. He said, The Lord roars from Zion and makes his voice heard from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds mourn and the summit of Carmel withers. The Lord says, I will not relent from punishing Damascus for three crimes, even four, because they threshed Gilead with iron sledges. Therefore, I will send fire against Heziel's palace, and it will consume Ben-Hadad's citadels. 
I will break down the gates of Damascus. I will cut off the ruler from the valley of Avon and the one who wields the scepter from Beth Eden. The people of Aram will be exiled to Kerr. The Lord has spoken. The Lord says, I will not relent from punishing Gaza for three crimes, even four, because they exiled a whole community, handing them over to Edom. Therefore, I will send fire against the walls of Gaza, and it will consume, consume its citadels. I will cut off the ruler from Ashdod and the one who wields the scepter from Eshkelon. I will also turn my hand against Ekron, and the remainder of the Philistines will perish. The Lord God has spoken. The Lord says, I will not relent from punishing Tyre for three crimes, even four, because they handed over a whole community of exiles to Edom and broke a treaty of brotherhood. Therefore, I will send fire against the walls of Tyre, and it will consume its citadels. The Lord says, I will not relent from punishing Edom for three crimes, even four, because he pursued his brother with the sword. He stifled his compassion. His anger tore at him continually, and he harbored his rage incessantly. Therefore, I will send fire against Teman, and, I will, and it will consume the citadels of Basra. The Lord says, I will not relent from punishing the Ammonites for three crimes, even four, because they ripped open the pregnant women of Gilead in order to enlarge their territory. Therefore, I will set fire to the walls of Rabbah, and it will consume its citadels. There will be shouting on the day of battle and a violent wind on the day of the storm. Their king and his princes will go into exile together. The Lord has spoken. The Lord says, I will not relent from punishing Moab for three crimes, even four, because he burned the bones of the king of Edom to lime. Therefore, I will send fire against Moab, and it will consume the citadels of Kiriath. Moab will die with a tumult, with shouting and the sound of the ram's horn. I will cut off the judge from the land and kill all its officials with him. The Lord has spoken. This is the word of God. Have a seat. So just to place all of this before we get going, I've got a map here. Amos lived and prophesied about 750 years before Jesus came on the scene. And he lived in a little village, it says, called Tekoa, that's about 70 miles, you can see here, or it'd be about a two and a half day from Jesus' hometown of Galilee, if that helps you place things. Amos' village of Tekoa was part of a larger region called Judah, which we sometimes refer to as the Southern Kingdom. And he lived near the border of Israel, which has been called the Northern Kingdom. So if you can kind of place all that. And Israel, that Northern Kingdom, had seized its independence from uh, them about 150 years before Amos wrote this. And this was uh, at the time that their king, Jeroboam II, a military leader, had grown Israel's borders and its bank accounts. Things were good in Israel. By all accounts, Israel was wealthy and successful, but we're going to see that God thought this nation was far from him. Money and comfort had led the people to not care about God, which led to them worshiping everything and anyone except God. Their wealth and comfort also made them focus on themselves as opposed to loving other people, which led to terrible injustice and neglecting the poor people that were right in their own midst. Amos's message is going to consist of, you're going to see over these weeks, there's going to be sermons and there's going to be poems and there's going to be visions. But do you see in verse 1, if you're looking at your Bible, all of this is what God allowed him to see regarding Israel, his neighbor to the north. You can imagine how excited Israel would be. So he's not from Israel. He's actually from this other kingdom down south. You can imagine how excited they would be since they declared their independence that here comes this guy from this southern kingdom below them to come up and, and talk about God's judgments against them. Amos is referred to, by the way, as a minor prophet. Maybe some of you have heard that, and that doesn't mean that his message was unimportant. It simply means that compared to what we call the major prophets, guys like Isaiah and uh, Jeremiah and Ezekiel, his, his message is just shorter. So this book is smaller than what we would call the major prophets. So there's 12 minor prophets, and Amos is one of those. Now, Amos was also distinctly different from all of the other minor prophets. So the other 11 were different, and they were different in this way. Amos was not a professional or a full-time prophet as they were. Amos was, in today's language, an ordinary Joe. Man, he would have been the blue-collar prophet of the bunch. He was a shepherd, verse 1 says. You see it there. And some of your Bibles actually say he was a sheep breeder. 
So Amos may have been involved in raising and buying and selling sheep. And Amos 7, 14 through 15, if you skip ahead a little bit or take a note, also tells us that Amos was a sycamore tree farmer. So other than his work, we know Amos did not have formal religious training. So think about this. This guy, Amos, never went to seminary. Nobody ever taught him how to study the scripture or how to put together a sermon or how to deliver a sermon. We find out that he grew up with a dad that was not a religious leader. So he didn't come from religious background with religious training and all that. So as I've been reading this book, guys, in the last few weeks to get ready to preach, I've been really, really thankful for this simple, ordinary, everyday guy named Amos. Because if you do look at uh, Amos 7, 14 through 15, this is how he described himself and how God called him. Listen to this. I was not a prophet or the son of a prophet. Rather, I was just a herdsman and I took care of sycamore figs. But, but, the Lord took me from following the flock and said to me, go and prophesy to my people. The Lord, no doubt, had prepared this guy, Amos, for that time when he, how does it say it right there in in 7.15? It says, God, I love this expression, think about this, took him from the flock and told him to go to my people. But God didn't prepare him for that moment, probably like you or I expected God to prepare him. So think about that. Amos's heart and mind was changed through the day in and day out, and week in and week out, right? And year in and year out course of life. I don't imagine the grind of being a rancher was any easier back then than it is today. It was probably a lot harder without all the conveniences of modern life. And every time I go back to Amos 1.1 and I started to reread this book again, I just pictured this, and I want you to do it too. Picture Amos prodding and, and pushing animals around. That must have been really dirty and physically exhausting, don't you think? Sheep resisting and even biting him when he was trying to do good for him. And I pictured Amos planting and pruning and picking and sorting through figs in the heat of the day, and that must have seemed really repetitive and pointless, and boring. Don't you think? It all made me think that, man, if the devil needed some ammunition in Amos' life for convincing him he was too ordinary, man, he wasn't from the right family. He wasn't trained enough. Man, you're, you're, you're too unqualified to go tell people about God. Amos writes in 7.15, he's like, I can't deny any of that, but what's he say again in 7.15? Here's what he says. But funny thing about that, the Lord took me from following the flock and said to me, go and prophesy to Israel. So somewhere in the midst of years of just doing his job, think about your life, somewhere in the midst of years of just doing his job and living life and obediently following God, Amos' heart and his spirit increasingly felt the weight of everything going on around him in the world. And at the time when God planned and appointed, at just the right time, God called Amos to travel from Judah up into Israel to speak his words to his people, right? In the power of his spirit, Amos was handpicked and he was carefully seasoned through all the things that the Lord had him doing as a shepherd and a tree farmer. Point number one, if you're taking notes. God sends the people with his truth. So throughout history, God has often called and worked through ordinary people, people who don't appear to be the obvious choice. Sometimes I feel like I'm a really great example. People that have a past, people that the world sees as lacking something. God often surprisingly calls ordinary people to serve him in surprisingly important and impactful ways. We got some great examples of this in our Bible, right? So let's go there. Abraham was an outsider that came from an unbelieving Gentile family, but God chose him to become the father of the faithful. How about Moses? Moses was an old man with a stutter, but God gave his law to his people through Moses, and he had Moses lead them in to freedom. David was a shepherd boy that God chose to become Israel's greatest king. If you want to go beyond the Bible, let's take some of those examples in a little bit more modern history. God continued to use ordinary people to bring about some of our greatest contributions. Think of guys like William Wilberforce, who was used by God to speak out against slavery, and his work led to slavery being abolished in most of the British Empire in the 1800s. 
William Booth, along with his wife Catherine. Maybe you've heard of their work. They founded the Salvation Army and did more than anyone just about to rally the church to create these city centers to help poor people. George Mueller, maybe some of you have heard of him. He wandered deep into sin and spent time in prison before he became a Christ follower. And by the time he died, he had established 117 schools and he had taken care of something like 10,000 orphans in the orphanages that he had set up. Rosa Parks was used by God to speak with boldness and inspire many pastors to stand up against the injustice of racial segregation. So I just prayed this week that God would gloriously keep raising up ordinary people, just like Amos, right here in this room. Some ordinary people, man, that might look like college students or retired folks or newly married couples or singles navigating life or moms at home or middle-aged guys grinding out their jobs in the day-to-day. Amos was a regular church attender and a farmer. That's all he was. And he was called by God to be a prophet to a nation that by all accounts was wealthy and doing really well. Who comes up with plans like that? That doesn't make any sense. That's, that's not what we would do. It's what God did. So look around and ask yourself, why is it that God brought you to this specific place in life? To those roommates, to that mom or that group of moms that are struggling, to a town that, that had fallen asleep spiritually, to your neighbor next door, to a church full of a bunch of 18 to 25-year-olds, to a coworker that's a challenge to get along with? Who has God put in your life and on your heart? You will likely not be called to prophesy to a nation, but you and your life are going to be far from ordinary in the hands of a God who sends people out with his truth. So go back to point number one. God definitely is the sender of people, But these first few verses, if you're looking there at Amos, shows us that God sends people not to speak their own truth or to promote themselves, but to speak his message and his truth. Look at that. Although Amos was sent as a prophet, seems like kind of a big deal, he was only sent as a prophet. The message he gave was God's message. In fact, the book, although we call it Amos, is not about Amos. And it's actually not about all the kings and the nations that we're going to talk that he spoke to. Actually, the book that you're reading is about the king of the universe. Brothers and sisters, that's not a bad thing. That's a really good thing. Verse 2, if you're looking at it, says the message that Amos brought was from the Lord, and he was roaring. When you think of things that roar, what do you guys think about? Do you think of thousands of fans packed into a stadium cheering on Caitlin Clark? Do you think about an intense storm or maybe the roar of of turbulent ocean waves? I don't know. But no doubt the roar that Amos said God's message was like was the roar of a menacing and pursuing lion. So imagining the Lord as a lion and his message like a roar, that was meant to stir up thoughts and feelings of ferociousness and swiftness. I remember visiting the zoo in Madison, Wisconsin over the years. Maybe some of you have been there. It's the Henry Vilas. It's the free zoo, right? You just have to sometimes make a contribution. We did that a lot as a young family. And I remember being physically frozen and like literally stopping mid-sentence with whatever I was saying when the lion roared. He was in an enclosure, and my family could be like on the other side of the zoo, and yet you could hear him roar, and you could feel it. Have you guys experienced that? As the vibrations like tremor through your body, literally you feel your insides vibrating when you're by a roaring lion. It's the craziest thing. And if you've never seen a lion, the sound of his roar alone would cause you to reflexively look around and make sure you're not in danger. Even if you didn't know what was going on, you'd be like, that seems dangerous. Kids and adults alike don't have to be told when the king of beasts is speaking and that he's powerful. We just know that. In Amos' day, the lions weren't behind enclosures, were they? They freely roamed about in savanna-like grasslands in Judah and Israel, and their speed and their strength and their hunting prowess was well known by everybody that was reading this original message. It was awe-inspiring, right, and sobering for a prophet to use this picture. Just a little later in the same book, in chapter 3, verse 8, here's what Amos is going to say. A lion has roared. Who will not fear? The Lord, God, 
has spoken. So interestingly enough, I was thinking about when I was getting ready to preach, tomorrow morning, I'm a police officer. I'm going to be standing in a courtroom. This is what's on my schedule tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. And I'm going to witness a judge pronounce judgment and a sentence of life imprisonment on a law breaker. And I've been in that position a lot of times before, and I can tell you what that's going to look like. I can picture it. No one will be speaking. No one will be questioning the judge. And no one will question his judgment. So here in Amos' words, a much greater and righteous judge is moving and speaking. The Lord is roaring like a lion in judgment. It is powerful, sovereign roaring from the king of all creation. Now, let me just say something here, and I want to say this right. Many of us have minds and hearts that are only full of very sweet and sentimental thoughts and images of God. Brothers and sisters, man, praise the Lord. The Bible in so many places and in so many ways tells us that King Jesus is like a lamb. Loving and tender. But for a moment, for this time, for this passage, we must also see that our Lord should not be seen as just that. Joel 3.16 says, The Lord is a refuge to his people. He's a stronghold. But in that very same verse, do you know what else it says? It says this, The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth quake. A guy named Jonathan Edwards, he was a Puritan preacher, once preached a sermon called The Diverse Excellencies of Christ Jesus. And in it, Edwards encouraged people, encourages us, to actually read our whole Bible and see that our Lord is at all times excellent, but he's also at all times diverse in his excellencies. Meaning this, sometimes when we look upon him, we see more of the lion, and sometimes we see more of the lamb, but both are ever-present in our beloved King Jesus. The lion excels in strength and in majesty, of his appearance and his voice, the lamb excels in meekness and patience, and lambs are sacrificed for food. But if we keep reading our Bibles, we see Christ is compared to both. In him is infinite mercy, yet man, he has total humility, perfect justice, and he's got boundless grace, absolute sovereignty, and somehow in that, complete submission. All sufficiency, all sufficiency in himself and yet entire trust and dependence on God, his heavenly Father. So as you look at verse 2 one more time with me, we should see God's message here should be heard as though from the mouth of a roaring lion. So let's go back to the Madison Zoo for a minute. And my family's going to roll their eyes when I say this because I know it's true. The last time I heard the lion roar, I wanted to pull out my iPhone and record a video of the roaring lion with me smiling in the foreground and pointing at him. Right? I thought that was a great idea. Friends, I feel perfectly safe smiling and laughing and making silly videos of the greatest of all the beasts. And then I go on to to the next exhibit because I'm convinced the roaring lion will never get out of his enclosure. In fact, over the years, we regularly went back to that zoo. I never worried about the lion. Oftentimes I didn't see him. Maybe he was sleeping or maybe he was just off in another part of his, of his habitat. Even if he roared, and I liked it when he did, it was really cool, I never felt threatened, nor did I ever change anything because I was sure he would never get out of his enclosure and get close enough to do anything to me. It's kind of funny, isn't it? But Amos tells us today in chapter 1 that the people surrounding him knew God. They had heard his words before. They actually did know how powerful he was, and yet they smiled and enjoyed their life of wealth and ease and acted like the Lord was a lion that would never, ever get out of his enclosure. In chapter 1, as you're looking at that, nearly 2,800 years ago, in the place we know as Israel, the Lord roared at the sin in the world. Amos says in verse 2 that God's word can be heard like a lion roaring in Zion and Jerusalem. Do you see that there? The old one was stirring from what he had established at one time as the religious center. That's what Jerusalem was at one time. 
We'll see in weeks to come that the people in the northern kingdom of Israel had actually rejected God and rejected this place of Jerusalem and they built their own imitation Jerusalem so they didn't have to travel so far and go down to the southern kingdom anymore. They just made their own religious places. Sin was running deep and rampant, not just in Israel's neighbors that didn't even claim God and to be his people, but also in the lives of those who were supposed to be God's own people. Does God care? God's message through Amos was and is, God cares and he holds all people accountable. Brothers and sisters, man, before we move on, we got got to do a little self-reflection here today in Blades Chapel. We need to see the sins of the unbelieving nations surrounding Israel and think about what that says about us. So here's my question to you. Are you not coming to church regularly, seeing the Lord at work in this place, and in people's lives, hearing his words clearly, sometimes reading with your own eyes that what you're doing in your life is sin against the God who made you. Man, haven't you caught glimpses of God at some point? Has that small voice in your heart said, man, I know I'm doing wrong. Have you felt God drawing close to you recently? But then you check the lion's enclosure, so to speak, don't you? You just, you just, Look over. You make sure that God isn't going to get out. You move on to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing before God gets too close. Are you pretty sure that God doesn't care about the sin in your life? Amos is speaking to the person in your seat this morning. He's saying God cares about your thoughts. And he actually cares about your words and he cares about your actions, both the ones that people see and all the things that you're doing that people don't see and don't know about. God cares, and he's going to hold you accountable. This lion that we read about here cares, and he is not enclosed. He is free, and he is roaring. C.S. Lewis, in his famous book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, created a character that was a lion. It was supposed to be a symbol of Jesus. And one character sees the lion and asks if it is safe. And another character is shocked and responds, safe. And who said anything about him being safe? Of course the lion isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king. So Veritas, before we go on to point two, I would say, would you allow your understanding of the Lord to be in part a very fierce and a very unsafe lion that is roaring a message of judgment against the sin of the world and against the sin in your life? A lion that is not in a closure, It's not safe. You should not come to visit church on Sunday here and snap selfies with God and then go unchanged back to your sin. The Lord is a lion that should cause you, if you see him rightly, to respond before the day of judgment. Point number two. God judges the sin and he does it in his own time. And I might add, and in his own way. What's interesting is you look at verse three with me is that Amos, when he gets rolling, doesn't actually start by prophesying against Israel, which he promised you he was going to do in verse 1. He's like, all these things I saw, they're, they're for Israel. Even though he says that, he doesn't talk about Israel right away. So as you start to look down in, through verse 3 and the rest of the passage we read, Amos actually starts by addressing the sin of all the nations surrounding Israel. He goes with all of them first. These are unbelieving, or what we sometimes call pagan nations, that have not recognized the Lord as their God. They're not even supposed to be God's people. But their ignorance is no defense. Look at this. They were, according to Amos, held accountable for their sins, regardless of what they knew or thought or believed about God. I know that's surprising. No one is excluded from God's judgment. All of us will give an account to him. So beginning in verse 3 and continuing through chapter 2, verse 3, Amos specifically mentions six of Israel's neighbors and why God will be bringing his judgment against them. So we're going to see each one of these six nations was called out for something in particular, but there's a common thread that runs through all six of these and the prophecies, right? And it has to do with how terribly they are treating their fellow persons. God's roar against Israel that you're going to see next week and the weeks that follow, is going to focus on their not loving God the way they should and how they're not keeping their covenant. But today, when he talks to the nations 
the godless nations around, he focuses on their cruelty towards other people. So if you're looking at that map again, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to read through all these verses, but just follow with me. I'm going to summarize who is named and where they're located. So the map's going to help you place these, so watch. So one eye on your Bible, one eye up here. And as you look at your Bible, you're going to notice that each of these neighbors gets about three verses. And each of the nation's little sections starts with, do you see it there? The Lord says. Right? So six little sections like that. He begins in verse 3 through 5 with the city of Damascus, which was located in the nation of Aram. Notice it's to the northeast of Israel. Next in verses 6 through 8, Amos points towards Gaza, a city in the nation of Philistia, which was located to the southwest of Israel. Verses 9 through 10 is where Amos mentions Tyre, which is a city in the nation of Phoenicia, which was Israel's neighbor to the northwest. Do you see Amos is just starting to, to encircle Israel as he slowly mentions each of these neighbors. Next in verses 11 through 12, Amos calls out Edom, which is to the southeast. You can't see that one. He ends with Ammon in verses 13 through 15 and Moab in chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Both of these were located, as you see here, to the east of Israel. Take one more peek at this map. So you've got Aram, Philistia, Phoenicia, Edom, Ammon, and Moab. Amos has literally drawn a circle, and in the middle of it, do you see that, sits Israel, the one that he's supposed to be prophesying with. So like a target that's in God's crosshairs of judgment, he's setting up what's coming next. So next week, you can come back, Austin Claver is going to preach beginning in chapter 2, verse 4, and you're going to see this lengthy and intense accusation against Israel who were supposed to be God's own people, and they had rejected him. But let's go back, because today we're just talking about these surrounding godless nations around Israel. So what, what does Amos say about their sin? Notice each nation's write-up not only begins with, the Lord says, you see that there, but a comment about how each of them would be punished, did you hear that? For crimes, for three crimes, even four. This, this doesn't mean that God is watching, and when these nations hit like a certain number, automatically God's judgment, like, up, oh, that's the number, that's, you know, punishment's kicking in doesn't mean that. Amos's expression for three crimes meant their sins were plural, more than just one. And by adding on that little expression, even for, it was like saying, you know what? Man, it's just a bunch of sins. More sins than I can even count. More sins that we can remedy here. It's just a mess. That's how he was starting each one of these. Now remember, our guy, the prophet Amos, had on God's calling, traveled north from his home in the southern kingdom of Judah up to Israel. And it wasn't like he was warmly received. They probably thought his accent was weird, right? They probably weren't super excited about him showing up. But when Amos started off by prophesying against Israel's neighbors, man, I imagine there was lots of amens and that will preach, right? That was super cool. Man, I mean, let's be honest. Who doesn't love a preacher who tells his congregation what's wrong with everybody else? Right? We all love that. Man. What a great way to warm the room. I could have spent more time discussing the evil and sinful actions of every one of Israel's neighbors here. Look down through 1-3 through 2-3. Do you see their utter disregard and lack of love for God's fellow image bearers? Let me just hit a couple high points. In verse 3, how they treat others is compared to, a, do you see it there, a grain thresher, which is a heavy wooden sledge that got pulled around by an ox and it was used to separate the grains of kernel from the hole. Okay? Amos uses that well-known device as a comparison to how the people were treating one another. As if, man, there was, people were nothing but a pile of grain and we could just run this thing back and forth over them and crush them. He's like, yeah, that's, that's how you treat each other. God's judgment for their sin, if you're looking there, would be consuming fire, which when he says that, that's war. And their citadels and their gates and their rulers, those are all the things that they had put their, their confidence in he said, yeah, they're going to be removed, and you're all going to be exiled. Amos prophesied next against the Philistines and the Phoenicians by saying that God would judge them because they had a hand in ruthlessly deporting people from their homelands. God's message against the sin of the Ammonites was for their viciousness and their brutality of attacks on others. They had no regard for human life, and they were without pity even for pregnant women. Do you see that there? All of this, Amos says at the end of verse 13, was 
in order to enlarge their territory. So think about that. Human life and love of others was traded for what? Growth and gain. That's what God says, man, no way. Don't you think the Sunday crowd that gathered to hear Amos just really enjoyed what they heard about the sins of all their, their neighbors? Man, we still can fall into this trap too. We can love to read our Bibles and just think about, man, this is cool. He's talking about somebody else's sins. And we can divide and push the world out and, and call them the sinners. And we can fail to be thinking about, man, what is going on inside my own heart? So how do we apply what we've read this morning as a group of Christians gathered together in Dubuque in Blades Hall in 2024? First, a couple thoughts of application maybe. Take note of how the Lord does care when people are cruel to other people. What's important to God is not who has political rights to a piece of land. What's important to God is how people treat each other, regardless of which political party or leader has governing authority. So remember our big idea. God cares and holds all people accountable. So here specifically with regard to how we as nations treat people and how you and I as individuals treat the people in our lives. As Christians, listen into this, as Christians we must care about other people's pain and suffering in the world. And the care must be the kind of care that actually feels something and acts and does something. As Christians, we have to care about other people's pain and suffering whether that's right in our own life or somewhere on the other side of the world. Second point of application maybe at this point. We need to resolve today to see this and believe that God is going to judge all sin. Can you see that as you're looking at your Bible? God's words in just these first 18 verses of this book show us that the whole world, from the worst of us to the best of us, man, we all get held accountable before one true God. The book of Romans, which we're actually going to preach through this fall, that's going to be awesome, so make sure you're back here for that. Man, it's clear that each and every human being is made by God in his image and has a conscience that's hardwired with enough knowledge that we're going to be held accountable. The first six nations that Amos mentioned here never received the Ten Commandments, but God still promised he was going to judge them. This would have been a very unpopular message and a very unpopular way to show love in Amos' day. And guess what? It's going to be a very unpopular message and a very unpopular way for us to show love to people today. But because we love our friends and our family, Veritas, and our fellow students and our coworkers, man, we have to lovingly not hide from telling them about God's certain and eternal judgment. Believing that God's judgment of sin is real and eternal and that hell is real is becoming a less and less acceptable idea in our world. But Veritas, let's follow Paul, who followed Jesus and said things like this. Let me just read from one of Paul's passages. Those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. We have to tell people what's coming, just like Amos did. And with that, I want to close with point number three. God restores the fallen through his son. So here's the amazing irony in all of this. The crazy clincher to our first message in Amos. The injustice against people that Amos called out in this first chapter, first and foremost, is injustice against God who lovingly created all those people. And that injustice against people, and therefore against God, came to its ultimate climax when Jesus actually came to earth. You see, Jesus came, the Bible says, to rescue and bring us back to God. And God's judgment and justice was served against all rebels and all injustice when Jesus gave his life in our place. Jesus paid our debt so that he would be perfectly just in not holding us accountable for our injustice. Can I just say that one more time? Jesus paid our debt so that he would actually be perfectly just in not holding us accountable for our injustice. So think about that. Amos' words are true. Sin will be judged. And sinners still go free. Both of those things are true. That's the meaning of the cross. Author author Christopher Ashe said it like this, and I really like this. All the curses due to a sinner 
are born by Jesus Christ if that sinner turns away from his sin and to God in faith. Veritas, a promise of God's certain judgment is still fulfilled when a sinner hears that warning and then prays that God's judgment for their sin would fall on Jesus. That judgment is still made good, but now that judgment isn't falling on an unjust sinner. It falls on a perfect Savior. His son bears the payment and the penalty, a just sentence so that all the injustice of those who would believe on him wouldn't be held against them. At the very moment that Jesus came to do that, man, our injustice against God reached its climax. Let me read for you in Acts chapter 8, 32 and 33. This is what it says about Jesus' death on the cross and the injustice that took place. He, Jesus, was led like a, a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb is silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied Jesus. This is the miracle, guys. This, this is the, the miracle of the cross, the miracle of the death of Jesus, the miracle of the gospel, the miracle that changed my life. And man, it's changed the lives of many of you in this room. Pastor John Piper says it this way. The miracle is that in the very moment when we withheld justice from the Son of God, justice was satisfied so that those withholding justice could be justified. This is the good news. God restores fallen sinners through his Son by taking the penalty of your injustice and sin that you've committed. That's Amos chapter 1. That's judgment preached to these godless nations. And man, it's Jesus actually taking their injustice if they turn to him. It's Jesus taking your sin and injustice if you turn to him. So as James uh, and Tacey come back up here to join me, I want to invite you to take communion during these last two songs. If you've experienced this miracle of forgiveness in Jesus. So we've got tables at the front, tables at the back. And I want you to come up during these last two songs and take a piece of bread Take a cup of juice and remember that these are, these are symbols for Jesus' body and his blood that were taken unjustly on the cross. Think of the injustice of, of that crucifixion. So that God's judgment for us was totally satisfied in that sacrifice. And in doing that, he brought us back and he purchased a people for himself. So man, if you know Jesus like that, and come up during these two songs at any time and take the bread, take the cup, take them back to your seat. And man, celebrate and remember Christ dying for your sin. And if, man, if you're not there yet, that's okay. Just stay in your seat and sing. Grab me afterwards. I'd love to talk about how this could be a reality in your life. So would you guys join me before we do that? I'm going to pray. And let's ask God to lead us out in this. Lord, thank you for the fact that you see everything, including the injustice and the, the terrible ways that we treat each other. And you care. Man, thank you for Amos and for the reminder of you as the, the roaring lion, Lord, that you have a plan to make good and to judge the injustice of the world. And Lord, I pray that you would raise up ordinary people in this room. Lord, that you would raise up some here to do things in their pockets, and Lord, in our society and in our town, wherever you send them, Lord, that they would take not their message, but your message, Lord. And so we thank you for the good news of Jesus Christ, Lord, of the injustice on the cross and his death, but Lord, the trade that was made, Lord, that my injustice and others' injustice can be paid for in Christ's sacrifice. Lord Jesus, would you lead us into the throne room of God? And we love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.